joints connect these two shafts together okay it's a point of fulcrum or the joint of the faucets then you have blades usually it is the blades that differentiate most of these faucets okay it is the blade that actually give faucets their differences and the ratchets some faucets will have lock or the ratchets while others do not have so the parts of the faucets will include the finger bow which is this the shaft okay the shaft the ratchet, the joint, and the blades. So these are various parts of the of a faucet. 
And you should understand that um, identifying a forcept requires you to know how the blade of that forcept looks like. Okay, we, we are going to see different types of forcets. Now, the first one we'll look at is a sponge holding forceps or a rampless forceps. Now, you should know that it's not all about identifying a forceps in your exams. What really matters is the questions that follow. Identifying a forceps or an instrument is not enough. You should be able to answer questions that follow okay the picture now you can see as we describe the various parts of a forceps this is the finger bow okay this is the ratchet this is the shaft this is the joint and this is the blade now if you look at the blade of a rampless forceps or a sponge holding forceps, you will see the tip of the blade is fenestrated. It's fenestrated. This piece here is called fenestration. Okay. And also the fenestrated blade also have transverse serrations, these lines, transverse serrations, as well as fenestration. Now you should know most of those forceps with fenestration is to aid bulging of tissue it is holding, not to cause complete crushing of a tissue, okay? Now, what are the uses of a sponge holding forceps? As the name implies, it is used in holding sponge or gauze to clean an operative field. Now, you can also swap cavities with a rampless forceps. When you hold a sponge, you clean inside a cavity, okay? Either secretions or blood within a cavity. You can also use a forceps to hold organs during operation, to hold the gallbladder during cholecystectomy. You can hold the cervix during manual vacuum evacuation, okay? Or even the stomach during surgeries. Now you can see how these rampless forceps look and you should be able to identify it when you see um, if, um, the rampless forceps and you should know it has different sizes. They are large, which are longer ones, medium and smaller ones. Now, these are some questions that follows. Now, how many times will you clean an operative field? How many times will you want to clean an operative field? Usually the standard skin preparation before an operation requires you to clean the operative site, okay, with an antiseptic solution. Usually you clean with cetrimide or savlon. When you clean with cetrimide, you dry it off, then apply a spirit or povidone iodine. Now you can also clean with povidone. There are various cleaning agents. So it is required you clean the operative field three times, okay? But in some cases, you might see a lot of deaths, which even after cleaning three times, it might not be sufficient. You might want to clean more. So, but you can clean three times, then you dry it off, then you apply spirit over the operative side and allow that to evaporate or you can apply povidone iodine okay so you have various agents what agents you use in cleaning okay 
how will you clean? Now, it is expected when cleaning, you clean from the proposed site of the incision and you move outward. It is expected you clean from the proposed site of the incision and you move outward. For example, if you have a patient, this is the abdomen. This is the umbilicus and you want to make an upper abdominal incision or a long midline incision. Now you start cleaning from this site, the proposed site of incision, and you move outward, okay? You move outward from the middle to the periphery, okay? You move in a century, fugal uh, direction from the middle and then you move outward because it is expected the, the innermost side should be cleaner. You shouldn't clean from outward, inward because you are bringing death to the operative field. So that is the manner in which you clean an operative site. From your proposed site of in incision, you clean outward. And also you should know when cleaning an operating field, it is um, advisable you clean all areas that might require manipulation during the operation. Because if you clean only the proposed site of incision and later another site might require a manipulation, and you touch that side, it means you have contaminated the operation field. And that is a breach of asepsis. You have breached an um, aseptic procedure. For example, if you are doing an abdominal operation, okay, let's assume this the abdomen. Okay. Okay, so let's assume this is the abdomen. You want to clean, you want to make a long midline incision. Now you clean from the nipple line, okay, up to the mid thigh. You go beyond the abdomen and clean up to the mid thigh. Don't clean only this side of incision. So you have to clean. Uh, from the nipple tie for every standard abdominal surgery. You clean from the nipple line to the mid tie. It has to, you must extend your cleaning up to the tie because sometimes during abdominal operation, you might even injure a vessel that might require a venous graft. And usually you take graft from the long saphenous vein. You just go, to the tie, harvest that, and um, graft the vessel you injured. And in a trauma patient, you go that sustain maybe an abdominal trauma, you have to clean from the suprasternal notch, from the clavicle down up to the mid tie, because the trauma might even extend to involve a thoracic. Um, it might be a thoracic injury. So now we are we will be able whenever we see this instrument, we should be able to um, describe it. Okay, we should identify, describe, mention some of the uses, and answer some questions that may be related to the instrument. Okay, the next forceps we'll be looking at is a toral clip. A toral clip. If you look at the toral clip, it has a finger bow as we describe a forceps. It has a lock or a ratchet. This is the shaft. This is the joint and the blade. 
is a pin like is a curved and a very sharp pins okay so the blade of a twirl clip are two curved pins that are very strong and sharp as the name implies is a clip it's used to fix drape in operative field you know after cleaning an operative field you have to drip the patient meaning you cover all other parts exposing only the operative site to minimize risk of any contamination so sometimes you might have um a, uh, drapes that are recycled not disposable for disposable drapes you might not need a towel clip because they have adhesive surfaces that when you apply them on the patient they just get ahead you don't need any towel clip but for drapes that are reusable you need to you need to um, fix them using a towel clip okay you also use this tool clip to fix suction tubes and diatomy diatomy wires on the operative field okay you use to fix rip in flail chest in the past in the past usually now nobody does that again in the past they can use it to fix a fractured little segments okay of the chest then they attach these to the a pulley which will um, um, retract the flail segment upward okay what i mean is you have okay something like this If these are the sharp blades, it's used to hook over a fractured segment, okay? And this is now attached to a pulley, which will maintain retraction of the fractured segment but of course nowadays nobody does um fixing of a flail segment using this intermittent positive pressure ventilation is what is done for such okay so we should be able to identify a tool clip mention its parts and mention the various uses. And mark you, just the way we described the various parts of a full set. Anytime you are asked to describe any instrument or a device in an exam, anytime you are asked to describe an instrument or a device in an exam, you have to follow a systematic pattern one the first thing you do you identify that instrument the next thing you mention the parts of that instrument okay you mention the uses uses of that instrument now if it's a, an instrument or a device or any material that requires a procedure you describe the procedure which we'll see later when we are talking about all the materials like urethral catheter ng tube and so on and the tracheal tube so all that requires a procedure you will mention the procedures okay then you mention complications that may be associated with use of such instrument or device. So 
identify, mention the path, mention the uses. If there is any procedure, you describe the procedure. Then you mention complications that may be associated with use of such instrument, okay? Okay. Now we'll talk about artery forceps or hemostats, artery forceps. Now, as the name implies hemostats, they are hemostatic, their main use is to secure hemostasis. And that is where they derive their name from, artery forceps or hemostat. Now, we've already mentioned the parts of a forceps, so it applies to all these forceps. We are not going to be repeating ourselves. Now, there are various types. You can see it's a small, which is commonly known as the mosquito artery forceps, the medium and the large artery forceps. It can also be classified as a straight or curved artery forceps. Now, these small artery forceps, like the one you can see in this picture, it's the mosquito artery forceps. And it is described as mosquito artery forceps because it is believed that the precision, the tip is so precise that you can grab the proboscis of a mosquito. Okay, the proboscis of the mosquito is what it's used in sucking. Okay, and that is very tiny. So the precision of an artery forceps, the small artery forceps is so high that you can even pinch the tip of the proboscis of a mosquito. So um, how do you describe the blades? I told you most of the time, it is the blade used in describing or differentiating uh, most of the forceps. Now the transverse, it has a transverse serration. And when you talk about transverse serration, if you look at a blade and you look at the inner surface of the blade, this is, you see some transverse lines like this. They are called transverse serrations. There are also serrations called crisscross serrations, which you will see in a needle holder, okay? A needle holder has crisscross serration, and that is how you differentiate an artery forceps from a needle holder. Artery forceps has transverse serrations, which you can see here in the inner surface of the, the blade. And you can also differentiate artery forceps from a sinus or a dressing forceps. They say dressing forceps or a sinus forceps by having this lock. The dressing forceps or sinus forceps do not have lock. Artery forceps, they all have locks. Now, what are the uses? To catch bleeding points, secure hemostasis. You can use artery forceps for dissection of planes, facial planes. So you can use artery forceps for blunt dissection to pass sutures and ligate. So to, for passage of and ligation of sutures, you can use it to pass ligatures. You can use it to hold sutures. You can use it to crush the base of an appendix during appendicectomy, okay? If the base is not inflamed or if the cecum is not inflamed, you use an artery forcep to crush the base, okay? Then you release, move to a higher position and crush and maintain the artery forcep. That crush area, you now tie with a suture so that there is a firm grip and also it doesn't cut through. Now, artery forceps is one of the main instruments you use during circumcision. Okay, you use it in holding the prepuce in circumcision. So these are there are several uses of an artery forceps. These are just some uses. Okay, 
Now, bleeding being the main role, the main use or function of an artery faucet, questions that may come or related to these artery faucets may be around hemorrhage. You might be asked to classify hemorrhage. What are the steps to secure hemostasis, differentiate with a needle holder? These are various oral questions. If you might sit in an oral exam and you pick something like this, okay, these are questions that may, okay, that may feature. Now, you should know that classification of hemorrhage is an important question in surgery. And you describe hemorrhage as excessive blood loss. Now, basically, you can classify hemorrhage as one primary reactionary and secondary hemorrhage. So this first classification is based on timing, okay? Based on the timing of bleeding. When you say primary hemorrhage, it occur at the time of surgery. Usually intraoperatively, when there is excessive bleeding during surgery, that is primary hemorrhage. Reactionary hemorrhage usually occur after surgery, but less than 24 hours. And usually the cause of reactionary hemorrhage is from slippage of ligature or dislodgement of clots postoperatively because during the operation, the BP is low from your anesthetic agent, usually inhalational anesthetic agent. And um, after the surgery, when patient recovers and the BP goes up, if there was a suture that was not properly secured or there is a clot that is just blocking a vessel, the blood pressure will dislodge that loose suture or a clot and patient starts bleeding, okay? And this is usually common amongst hypertensive patients, reactionary hemorrhage. So it's bleeding in less than 24 hours. When you talk about secondary hemorrhage, it actually occurs after 24 hours. It, it is after 24 hours and it is due to infection. Because when infection occurs, there is breakdown of blood vessels, okay, and patients bleed. Now, surgeries that are commonly associated with secondary hemorrhage are hemorrhoidectomy, prostatectomy, okay? That, so you should know one way of classifying hemorrhage. And importantly, for example, uh, more importantly, for trauma patients, okay? For trauma patients, you can classify hemorrhage into classes. You can classify hemorrhage into classes, class one to four hemorrhage. This is very important based on the amount of blood loss, okay? When it's, you have class one hemorrhage, okay, or type one hemorrhage, okay? So type one, less than 15% of total blood volume, okay? This is the, the, the second class is based on the amount of blood loss. So type one is less than 15% of blood loss, uh, total blood volume. Type two is 15 to 30%, okay? Type three is 
thirty to forty percent, and type four is more than forty percent. So this is an important way of classifying hemorrhage. Now, class one usually they have anxiety. They start having tachycardia. Type two, there is marked anxiety, marked tachycardia. Patient is becoming um, dehydrated, but the blood pressure may be normal or reduced. In type three, they are they are confused, hypotensive, okay, and they they are they are they, they can be very anxious, okay, in type three. Okay, they have marked reduced blood pressure. Now in type four, they are already lethargic. They are confused. Okay, they are in shock. In fact, this stage, they are not even making urine. They are lethargic and they have marked tachycardia with a pulse rate that is greater than 140 beats per minute. Here, the pulse rate is around, okay, 120 to 140 beats per minute. But in type four, they are in shock and the pulse rate is more than 140 beats. They are, they are confused and lethargic. They are not making urine. In type three, they are anxious and confused, reduce blood pressure. Okay. So these are various types of hemorrhage you might encounter when you are discussing anything related to um, bleeding. If you have your questions, you can note them down after the lectures, then we'll mute all of you, then you can ask your question. Okay, now let's go back to the slides. What are the steps to secure hemostasis? You might be given a clinical scenario and a patient presents to the emergency with a bleeding, with bleeding on the limbs, bleeding from the limbs or bleeding, uh, open and overt bleeding. They have, it might be concealed or external internal or external. There are other ways of classifying hemorrhage we do not talk about, but we just mentioned only two. Now, if it is an external hemorrhage, you are supposed to what, secure that hemostasis at presentation at the emergency room. So what are the various steps? For example, a young man was involved in a road traffic accident and he was rushed into the emergency with deep laceration of the foot and is bleeding profusely, how will you secure hemostasis on that limb? Okay, so the various steps of securing hemostasis, number one, you have to do a pressure packing, okay? Pressure packing. You get gauze and crepe bandage. You pack and wrap with a crepe bandage. Now it's very important you use crepe bandage in pressure packing because it is what elastic. It will rarely cause an immediate compartment syndrome, okay? Because it is an elastic bandage, okay? So you use it with sterile gauze, apply on the cut surface, then wrap, okay, with your crepe bandage. So the first step of securing hemostasis we said is pressure packing, okay? Number one, pressure packing, okay? Number two, limb elevation. You have to elevate the limb, okay? Sometimes, all this will not work. Even at the elevated state, you have to apply sutures. You have to use sutures to ligate, okay? 
you might need a diatom. So there are some other agents. Chemical agents that are used to secure hemostasis. But practically, when a patient is rushed into the accident and emergency with an external bleeding on the limb, you apply pressure, elevate limb, you can suture, you can use diatomy, and so on. So these are various steps used in securing okay, hemostasis. Okay, differentiate with a needle holder. We've mentioned that an artery forceps has transverse serrations, while a needle holder, the blade has crisscross serration. Now, aside the crisscross serrations of a needle holder, it has a groove, a vertical groove. It has a vertical groove in the middle of the blade. So you will see a vertical groove here. Now, why is a needle holder having a vertical groove? Why is it having a crisscross serration? We will see shortly. So these are the various types of artery set. We said artery set could be straight or curved. You can see how the serrations are, okay? It could be small, which we say, a mosquito artery forceps, it could be medium size or it could be a large artery forceps. Now, this is a needle holder. This is a needle holder. A needle holder has the blade of the needle holder has crisscross serrations and it also have a vertical groove, a vertical groove. Now, the aim of all this is to enhance grip is to enhance the grip of a needle okay so that the needle don't wobble around the tip you have to stabilize your needle when you are suturing okay so this is a needle holder and we already mentioned all these parts which you will be able to describe and what are the uses is for holding needle during suturing. Okay. Now, this is a cocas, a cocas forceps. Now, a cocas forceps is like an artery forceps. However, it's not an artery forceps. You see, it has all the parts of an artery forceps. In addition, it has a tooted tip. You can see the serrations of the blade are also transverse. However, it has a tooth in the tip. Okay. And this is used for holding tough tissues like fascia. You use it in holding edges of fascia during surgery, okay, for maybe retraction or exposure. This is an Alice forceps, an Alice forceps. Now, if you look at the tooth of this Alice forceps, you can see, okay, these teeth. The tip got teeth on each blade opposing. The blades do not oppose. There's a space. When the teeth oppose to each other, it will leave a space in between so that it doesn't crush the tissue in between. The aim is to hold a tough tissue without crushing the tissue in between the blades. What are the uses for holding flap of skin? This is very useful during 
dissection of skin to create flaps in surgeries like thyroidectomy, mastectomy, where you raise flaps. When you raise flaps, the tooth forceps will be used, sorry, the alice forceps will be used for holding the tips for adequate exposure and retraction. For holding flap of skin, facial fibrous tissue, aponeurosis and other tough tissue. So you should be able to identify and talk about an Alice forceps. Now, Babcock. Now, everybody should be able to identify a Babcock forceps. If you are going to be asked a surgical forceps, Babcock will be the one. Okay. You can see the blades have triangular fenestration. If you look at the blade, you can see at the tip of the blade, okay? You can see how it's fenestrated. It has a triangular fenestration and there's a curve before opposing, okay? Creating a space. Now the blades have triangular fenestration, which allow tissues to bulge out. At the beginning, I told you forceps with uh, fenestration are atraumatic. The blade will not cause trauma to the entire tissue. Okay, so the, you have bulging. When you hold a soft tissue, it bulges out through the fenestration if it's soft. However, if you are crushing, if you, this lock, this ratchet has various steps, one to four steps. So if you crush the entire or you lock completely, the tip might still cause trauma to the tissue you are holding. So if you are to hold gently, just click the first lock. Okay, it's just to hold a tissue. Now the tip is non-traumatic, used to hold bowel, appendix, urinary bladder, ureter, lymph nodes. Okay, this is a, these are the important forceps that is used for surgery like appendicectomy, okay? When you are doing surgery for appendix, you, um, you hold the tip and the base of the appendix with a Babcock's forceps. So that you look at the mes and, uh, meso appendix for the vessels before you skeletonize and ligate and divide. So this is an important forceps for appendicectomy. Okay. Okay. Let me just allow some of you unmute yourself so that someone can identify this instrument for me. Straight artery forceps. Someone said straight artery forceps. Do you all agree with her? If you have a contrary opinion, you can mute and, and dressing forceps. Dressing forceps. Any other opinion? Hello? It's a sinus forceps, sir. Yes, it's a sinus forceps. Now you can see it's a forcep. It has a finger bow, as we mentioned. It has a, rash, uh, a shaft. You see the, the ratchet or the lock is missing. So it's not an artery forcep. And if you look at the blade, the tip, the proximal third of the blade is serrated. While the 
distal, uh, sorry, the proximal to third is not serrated. The distal one third is serrated, okay? This side is just smooth. So you, you call this a sinus process. When you are doing um, incision and drainage, okay? After making incision on an abscess, you want to break the loculations in the abscess. You insert a sinus forceps and spread, okay? So that you break all the loculations and you will adequately express the pulse, okay? That is good attempt, okay? So you can unmute yourself who can identify these forceps. Yes, any attempts? That is a McGill forceps. Excellent, this is a McGill's forceps, McGill's forceps. Excellent. So what are the uses? Who can tell us the uses of a Magill's forceps? Sir, removing a foreign body. Excellent. You can use you can use this to remove a foreign body from the airway. You can also use it to pack the airway. When you pass an endotracheal tube, an endotracheal tube that is uncuffed. You know, endotracheal tubes are two types. We will see when describing um, other devices. They are either coughed or uncoughed. Now, the uncoughed ones are used in the pediatric age group. So when you pass an endotracheal tube, you want to pack with gauze so that secretions don't go down into the trachea and you need an instrument that has a design that can go into the airway to pack okay the gauze and the McGill's forceps does that that is excellent so let's continue with the lecture okay so I'll mute all of you again so now, this is a dissecting forceps, a dissecting forceps, okay? Now, there are two types of dissecting forceps. You have the non-tooth and the tooth. The non-tooth is for holding soft, okay? Soft, friable tissue like peritoneum, boils, nerve, and vessels. While the tooth head is for holding tough structures like fascia or aponeurosis. They are used also to steady needle during suturing. So when you are, when you are suturing, you need to stabilize the uh, needle and you need a dissecting forceps to do that, okay? Now, if you look at this um, one on this image is the tooth, or some call it the tooth head, and this other one up here is the non-tooth. If you look at the tip, it doesn't have any tooth. Now, if you take a careful look of this particular one, this tooted one, it has a pin and a hole, okay? If you look at this particular one, it has a pin and a hole, okay? Now, and you know, for this particular type, you use it for very delicate, um, tissue, you don't want to, apply too much um, tension or pressure on that tissue because of the two-third um, tip. 
So if you apply that, because it is expected that your index finger, the tip of your index finger and the thumb are at this position. And that is where you press. So if you are applying too much pressure, the pin is going to prick your finger through that hole. And it is notifying you that you are applying too much pressure on the tissue. Okay. So we are expected to unmute ourselves and I, I answer this. Yes, who can identify this instrument? Yes. Thyroid dissection forceps. Yes, who answered this question? Sir, I did. I don't, okay. You are Zoom. Maria, sir. Is who? Maria, sir. Okay, Dr. Maria. Okay, Maria is a surgeon, so it's expected. So, Maria, tell us a little about the thyroid dissecting forceps. Sir, please, can you write the name there? Okay, it's called a thyroid dissector. Okay, sorry, thyroid dissector. So dissecting thyroid, okay? During thyroid ectomy, you actually need this. It has a blade and a handle. The blade is a blunt blade, okay? And it is not smooth. It has some vertical grooves that makes it rough. And also it has an eye. It has an eye for passing sutures. If you are tying the poles of the, um, the thyroid gland, you need that, okay? So let's continue. So this is a bad packer handle, a bad packer handle. A bad packer handle Okay, when you mount a blade, it becomes a scalpel. That's why it is called scalpel handle. And you can see there are different types. If you look at this backpacker handle, you see some calibrations. It has some calibrations. Okay, so you can see different sizes with different tips so that you mount different sizes of blades also. So what are the uses? One, you can use it to mount blade. It becomes a scalpel for dissection, okay? Two, you can use it for blunt dissection. Blunt dissection to create planes, okay? You create planes during surgery. You can also use it to measure the size of intraoperative specimen. You can see some have calibrations in centimeters. So when you excise a specimen, you can actually measure the size of that specimen using a backpacker handle, okay? The main uses are one, mounting a blade to become a scalpel. Two, you can use it for blunt dissection. Three, you can use it to measure intraoperative um, intra specimen and mark you they are all different sizes that carry different sizes of blades okay if you notice you see the blades are of different sizes depending on the procedure you want to do okay and you can see the they are designed in such a way that they will carry uh, different types of backpacker handle. Now we've talked about forceps generally. So now we'll talk about scissors, okay? We'll talk about scissors. And you should know that a scissors has 
there are two main classes of scissors. Okay, if you look at this, it looks curved. The blade looks curved. And if you look at the other one, the other one, it has a straight blade. Now, all the scissors that have these curved blades are surgeon scissors. The straight blades are assistant scissors. Now, there are various named scissors. There are different types of scissors, okay? And they are named. Now, the ones you see commonly are the Mayer scissors, the Makindo scissors, and the Mesenbaum scissors, okay? Those are the scissors you see commonly. The Mayer scissors, as you can see in this image, is different from the Makindo scissors. The difference is the broadness of the blade. For Mayer scissors, both of them, both Mayer's, Makindo, uh, Mesenbaum, they all have both the surgeons and the assistant scissors. And for the Mayer scissors, it has a broader blade. It has a broad blade. You can see this blade is broad, okay? Makindo also have curved and straight, but they are they have a thinner scissors so this is a surgeon scissors but to be precise it's a mayor's dissecting scissors this is also a mayor's assistant scissors because the blade is straight so who can identify this okay should i unmute you let's unmute you so that you identify Yes. Stitch cotton scissors. Okay, this is stitch scissors. This is stitch scissors. Okay. Because if you look at the blade, it is designed for stitch cotton. So this is stitch scissors. That is excellent. And you can see a Makindo scissors. If you compare this, you see the blade is um the blade is thinner, okay? The blade is thinner. So this is a Makindo, it's also a surgeon's scissors, okay? Now we'll talk about retractors. We've talked about, we've talked about um, forceps and briefly we talked about scissors and now we'll, um, talk about retractors. Retractors are surgical instruments used for adequate exposure of an operating field. Okay, you the principle of any surgery is number one, adequate incision. You make the proper incision. Two, adequate exposure. Three, proper mobilization, okay? You understand? If you are doing surgery of any sort, not necessarily laparotomy, you need to make a proper incision, okay? You need an adequate exposure. You need an adequate mobilization. Okay, then you now perform the appropriate procedure. Now, you see, if you don't have adequate retraction, you might encounter difficulty in performing any surgical operations. So that is where the retractors come into play. There are different types of retractors. They could be plain retractors, okay? They, they could be self-retaining retractors. Now, plain retractors, you, the, the retraction 
is maintained by the assistance of the operation. While the self-retaining retractor, okay, you can maintain the retraction with the retractor without the need of an assistant because it's designed in such a way that it can open and maintain the retraction. What are the uses to retract cut edges of tissue to hold important structures and to avoid inadvertent injury to tissue? Because if you are operating, okay, you are operating in the dark, you are operating without exposure, you stand a chance of inadvertent injury to other tissues. Now, this is a Langenberg retractor. It's a plain, sorry. It is a plain retractor, okay? You can see it has a blade, the shaft and the handle. Now, this Langenberg retractor could have a single or a double blade. It could have a single or a double blade. You might see some Langenberg with single or double blade. Then you might see some Langenberg with a fenestrated handle like this. Okay, it may have a fenestrated handle, but this doesn't have a fenestrated handle. So what are the uses of Langenberg retractor? Langenberg retractor are used for superficial retractions, like retraction for um, surgeries for superficial lumps. When you are excising superficial lumps like lipoma, okay, you use Langenberg. When you are doing procedures like hyaluronic you use Langenberg. Procedures like suprapubic cystostomy, lymph node biopsy, a lot of superficial surgeries, even thyroidectomy, you will need Langenberg, okay? So Langenberg is a very common plane retractor that is used in a lot of surgeries. So we mentioned it could be single blade or double blade. It could have a Langenberg with a fenestrated handle and the Langenberg with fenestrated handle will enhance the grip, okay, while retracting. Okay. This is a Morris retractor. Morris retractor is similar to a Langenberg retractor, but if you look at the if you look at the blade, is broader. It has a broader blade. Okay, it has a broader blade. is bigger. Okay, broader and longer than a Langenberg retractor. It can also come with a single blade or a double blade. You can see for this particular one, the handle is fenestrated, okay? And you can see some serrations at the edge, some serrations at the edge that will enhance grip while retraction. So Morris retractor is also a plain retractor. It requires retraction, maintenance of retraction by the assistant of that operation. And commonly you use Morris retractor for retracting the edges of, an, of the anterior abdominal wall during laparotomy, okay? Use it for retraction of the cut edges of the anterior abdominal wall during laparotomy, okay? You can also use it for retraction, retracting bulk of soft tissue during surgery. You have 
you need a retraction and there's a bulk of soft tissue you need to retract, you can use a Morris retractor, okay? Now, this is another atraumatic retractor that is called DIVAS, a DIVAS retractor. You can see it has a, um, a curved and broad blade, okay? It has a curved and a broad blade. It an, it's an atraumatic retractor for liver, spleen, and other abdominal viscera. Now, when you want to retract an organ that is easily friable, you use divas, like the liver. Sometimes you might even apply a soft pad or gauze over the blade, okay, to further reduce the atraumaticness. Now, if you look at this Morris, if you look at the blade, it is curved at the tip. So this can be traumatic, okay? You don't use a Morris retractor for liver retraction because the tip of the blade is also what curved. It can, you can cause trauma to that friable organ you are retracting. If you look at the divas, okay? The tip of the blade is, it's not curved, okay? So you, it's an atraumatic plane retractor. It's not a self-retaining retractor. It requires maintenance of retraction by the assistant surgeon. This is a Doyen's retractor. Oh. Now it's during pelvic surgery, you need to retract the bladder. Okay, you need to retract the bladder downward to prevent injury. Usually, if you are doing laparotomy, okay, the Morris retract the edges of the anterior, cut anterior abdominal wall, while the Doyens retract the pelvis to depress the bladder. Okay, so it is used for pelvic surgery. However, you have a self-retaining retractor that does these two function, retracting both cut edges of the anterior abdominal wall at, at the same time, depressing on the pelvis or the bladder. And that is a balfour, which we will see next. Okay, this is a self-retaining retractor or a ball force retractor. Okay, so a ball force retractor, you can see the edges. This cell is a self-retaining retractor. It has blades that will retract the cut edge of the anterior abdominal wall and also a Doyen's retractor that is attached to it that will retract the bladder downward. So this is a self-retaining retractor. It doesn't require maintenance of retraction by the assistant surgeon. It has three blades. Two blades are for maintaining retraction of the cut edges of the anterior abdominal wall and the, this doings is for depressing the bladder in the pelvis. You can see it has, uh, it is movable at this point. It is movable, okay? So this is the Balfour's retractor. It's a self-retaining retractor. Okay, this is a Joe's retractor. The Joe's retractor is used for thyroidectomy. The Joe's retractor is used for thyroidectomy or, so, uh, or for parathyroid surgeries. So you should be able to identify this and mention the surgeries it's used for. Now you should know the Joe's retractor, you use a pair 
of Joule's retractor for thyroidectomy. And each of the each of the blades has clips. And these clips are for holding the upper and the lower flap. During thyroidectomy, you create two flaps, the upper flap and the lower flap. Now on each of these flaps, so on each side of the neck, you have a Joule's retractor. And this Joule's retractor, this will hold the upper flap and this will hold the lower flap. And you have two on both sides. Okay, it has the knob here for opening and closing. It has a clip to open the blades, okay? So this knob, when you screw it, it opens the blade apart or, blade, or it brings them together. Why the clip here is for opening the pins. This clip is for opening the pins at the blade. Why the screw, the knob here is to screw the blades apart or bring them together during thyroidectomy. Okay, this is a millions retractor. It is used for bladder retraction. It is also used for open prostatectomy. Okay, this is a proper bladder retractor. Okay, it is used for when you open the bladder during open prostatectomy, you need a millions retractor. Okay, it parts the cut edges of the bladder. Okay, while this depresses. So it has three blades. It has a handle and a lock. Okay, these are the handles. This is the ratchet. These are the blades. Millions retractor. It's used for bladder retraction. This is a mastoid retractor. It's also a self-retaining retractor. Okay, you can see all the mastoid retractors. You have the handle, the ratchet, or the lock, then it has the blade. Now, this mastoid retractor, you use it for mastoid surgeries, scalp surgeries, laminectomy, it is hemostatic because these blades, they have hooks. They have hooks that when retracting the scalp, the skin or cut edge, they raise and avert the edges. And whenever you raise and avert the scalp, okay, you secure bleeding from the edge. So it is hemostatic. So at question time, someone will tell us the difference between a mastoid retractor and a traverse retractor, both are self-retaining retractors, okay? Now, this is a proctoscope. This is a proctoscope. Sorry, the slides. So this is a proctoscope. A proctoscope has, it has a sheet and, and an obturator, okay? This inner part, sorry, this inner part, this inner part is called the obturator. While the outer part is the actual proctoscope, which is the sheet, okay? Now, you need these two parts to insert. You can't just insert the sheet without the obturator, you might cause injury to the patient. So, because if you look at the obturator, it has a smooth 
tip that fits into the tip of the sheet. So when you pass both together, it is adequately lubricated, then it is passed into the rectum for examination, okay? Now, what are the indications for using a proctoscope? There are diagnostic and therapeutic indications. The diagnostic in indications when you are examining the rectum for hemorrhoids, fissure in anu, polyps, stricture, fistula in anu, and for biopsy of rectal tumors or anal tumors. So you need a proctoscope, okay? Now the therapeutic uses for injection sclerotherapy of hemorrhoid, okay? You need to pass a proctoscope so that you look at the point of injection, okay? just above just above the dentate line so that you don't cause pain okay you can also use it for during cryotherapy to for exposure of the hemorrhoids there are different types it could be illuminating or non illuminating the illuminating type you can see it has a light source the illuminating type has a light source that can be connected to a machine, okay? A generator that supplies light, okay? And when examining the rectum, it, it will be illuminated. While the non-illuminating type, you need a light source, okay? During examination, you need a light source. And we already talked about the parts. It has the outer part, which is the proctoscope, the sheet, and the obturator. So it is after you insert the proctoscope with the obturator, that is when you now remove uh, the obturator. Then you now examine as you gently pull out the proctoscope. Okay, this is called mallet. It's used as the orthopedic hammer. Okay, it is used as the orthopedic hammer. It is called the mallet. You know, orthopedic surgeons also have chisel and hammer, just like the carpenters. So that's why you call this an orthopedic hammer. But don't call it orthopedic hammer in your exam. It's called the mallet, okay? You use it along with the osteotome. Please don't call, it's not a chisel the carpenters use. It's an osteotome. Both sides are beveled. The chisel is only one side that is beveled. Both sides are beveled for removal of excess callus from bone and cutting bone chips for bone grafting. So this is the osteotome. You use the osteotome and the mallet, okay? So you hit on this side with the mallet while this other part is attached. The sharp tip is attached to the bone you are intending to cut. Okay, so the osteotome and the mallet goes, they go together. Now this is scoop or curate, used for scraping dead tissue or granulation tissue, okay? This is called a scoop or you can call it a curate. You actually use it for scraping surfaces, either dead tissue, granulation tissue you can so it can be used for mechanical debridement okay so you should also be able to identify a diatomy the parts of a diatomy the diatomy pencil okay you should be able to identify the indifference electrodes. The machine has both 
a coagulation and a cutting section and even the spray section. Okay. So you should read about diatomy, the principles of use of diatomy, especially residents. You must know these principles of use of diatomy in surgical practice. So diatomy itself is an extensive um, lecture on its own, okay? And you should understand the principle by which it works. So th there are suction tips. There are different types of suction tips used in sucking out fluid from an operating field or from cavities. This one called the Yankas, it has only two or three tips. It has a nozzle at the tip that sucks out secretions from cavities, okay? It's called the Yankas suction tip. Now, this other end is attached to the suction tube, okay? And this is the suction tip. And the suction for Yankas is only at the tip, okay? This small nozzle is screwed up at the tip and it has two openings where it sucks fluid, okay? It is not very good for sucking fluid from the peritoneal cavity, okay? It's better sucking from cavities without bowel or superficial suctioning. Because if you are sucking from the uh, peritoneal cavity with the bowel, it will, it will be the bowel will be interfering with smooth suction. Okay, while the other type called the pools, you can see it has an outer sheet and the inner suction tip. Now these will not interfere. The bowel will not interfere with suction from the pool. So this is better used for suctioning and the peritoneal um, from the peritoneal cavity, and it is it's not interfered with the intestine because the actual suction tube is the inner sheet. Okay, you can lose the outer sheet. Okay, but there are multiple tiny openings through which the fluid go in. Okay, so we have come to the end of section A of our lecture, and which will be the end of the lecture for today. Um, tomorrow, God willing, we are going to continue with the other section of instrument and, and devices where we'll be talking about some other materials that are routinely used in the wards, in the theater, uh, and in patients' management. So we've come to the end of the lecture. So we are going to entertain an interactive question and answer section now. So if you have any question, you can all um, unmute yourself and you ask questions. So thank you all for participating. We've come to the end of the first section of our lecture. So any question, we are going to entertain questions now. Yes, if you have questions. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. You are welcome. Good evening. I'm uh, Dr. Gusen okay. from Jute. I okay. um, want to thank you for this wonderful lecture. It's very helpful. 
Thank you. But sir, I want to ask, um, how can we get the recordings, please? Will it be made available? Yes, I'll upload them on the YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel. Okay. You just subscribe and you'll see all our lectures there. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And secondly, sir, for the lecture tomorrow, is it the same link we're using? No. Okay. Not the same link. I'll join the link. It appears okay. your friend your friend gave you the link. Okay. Yeah, I'm actually new. This is my first time. So I really don't know much about it. And I think for some of us that are new, we want to know what it's all about and what it entails. Okay, we have a structured program actually for residents uh, okay. and undergraduates and MDCN program. For the residents, we normally have lectures um, three times a week. Okay. okay. We normally register, there's a registration details, there's an outline and a curriculum we are supposed to cover. Okay. Yes, that is for the resident. And every um, class have their structured program that we run. Okay. Yes. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So um, for us that are interested, sir, how yes. do we register and, and participate? Um, you, okay, we'll discuss <laughs> after the lectures. Maybe you just chat me and... Okay, uh, sir. I'll send you all the details. Okay, so details. Okay, that's on this um, on this very platform. Okay, for this we have a WhatsApp number. Let me write it. You can okay, zero eight zero. Okay. So these are WhatsApp number. Yeah. You can okay, check sir. me, then I'll send you all the registration details. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. Okay. Yes. Okay, someone is asking the name of the YouTube channel. Okay, it's Met Tutors by Excellence. Let me write it. Okay, I'll just share the... Let me write it. It's double L, don't mind my writing. No problem. Okay, this is our YouTube channel. Okay, you can search for it and um, you see most of our lectures are on that. Yes, any other question? You know, when there is no question, it's either you understand everything or you don't understand anything. So I, I don't know which. Okay. Well, okay. I understood the one I, I, I followed <laughs> or oh, I was able to go. Okay. So thank you everyone. Tomorrow we are going to continue with the other section of um, the lecture. So thank you all for participating. Thank you, sir. You're all welcome. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.